Hello listeners. Welcome to season 2 of the Masters Decoder podcast. I am Anis Merchant, the chief decoder. I want to thank you for the overwhelming response to season 1. Your feedback and encouragement led me to bring you season 2 of the Masters Decoder. The season will tap into how technology, artificial intelligence and other socio-economic factors have impacted my guest careers or passions. My next guest on today's episode is Sukriti Jindal Khaitan. Sukriti is currently a co-founder at Asa Beauty. In addition, a catalyst to the development of one of the largest award-winning education platforms for children with learning and attention issues. She is an economics and psychology bachelorette from New York University, a certified nutrition health coach from the Institute of Integrative Nutrition. A passionate leader focused on clean awakening and building a conscious brand in the world of beauty. Without much further ado, let me get on with it. Hi Sukriti, welcome to Masters Decoded podcast series. Really glad to have you on the show today. Before we continue, a small word from our sponsors, anchor.fm. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There are creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcast, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Super excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me here. No, it's pretty exciting to have you uh, because uh, you know when I was looking up uh, Asa, uh, the company which you run, and uh, you know I also work in the industry. Not as I don't have my own beauty brand, but I have clients who have are the big majors when it comes to the entire consumer packaged goods. So you know the first thought which comes in, Sukriti is taking on the David Goliath fight. uh of <laughs> because beauty brands are not new they there are far too many in the market so why why beauty why beauty brands specifically so that's a really good question i mean a lot may even say that the beauty segment is super saturated and though some might even say that the clean beauty segment is already saturated um that being said so there are two of us uh, my mom in law who's actually my partner both of us sort of were sitting together here and discussing that like we still especially in india have not come across a brand that is able to maintain both the luxurious element along with a sense of consciousness or con- conscious mm-hmm. consumerism of sorts so we decided to sort of fuse together the two things um and create a brand centered around um not just a luxurious product per se but also the pro- the ingredients are completely clean and natural over 92% natural actually and alongside that we're not compromising on performance um and we're very authentic and true to what we say so um you know with the beauty segment at a rise um there are a lot of brands out there that are questionable as well in terms of the ingredients they put in their products and mm-hmm. that actually a lot of people are not aware of and you know our skin is our largest organ whatever we apply on our skin gets absorbed by our body so yep. when you're applying chemicals on a day to day basis that are not necessarily like good for you in the long run it can actually have you know pretty bad impacts on your body so um you know that being said we decided to get into this space and launch something that is clean and true to what we say again the other sort of issue in the beauty segment per se is that some in certain countries especially in india the um beauty industry is not so well regulated so mm-hmm. people can come up with things and you know that may not necessarily be good for the consumer and still you know be okay with it and market it as hey we are clean but but in reality you know someone who understands the intricacies of it may know that it may not be so we want to ensure that you know what we are producing as a product is something we would be happy to use and we stand by that um strongly you know uh is little bit about i know how to build brands uh, and what you're doing is pretty interesting but uh, it also poses a lot of challenge 
uh, like you said, um, and the statements you've used, that there are other brands who are also claiming the same things, which you may be talking about. Um, so there is clearly awareness issue. Uh, yeah. An awareness issue is maybe too much of awareness, but bad awareness because they because of good marketing, people might think that their particular brand may be good or bad, whatever the piece is. And uh, there's too much of awareness where people in India and globally as well, they think they know everything about beauty or they think they know everything about uh, the beauty products. So how, uh, you know, how are you trying to tackle it? Are you leading with the product or the brand or with the awareness first? So, um, you know, it's, I think it all stems from awareness and it all stems from actually being able to create a niche um, for yourself of like-minded consumers. So there are a lot of people in India who are conscious about what they're using, right? And they are particular about what they're using and they want to be sure that what they're using is not having an ha- having any harmful um, repercussions on themselves or on the planet. So, but the thing is that they're looking out for brands that can resonate with their value system. And that right now, to be honest, is not that, there are not that many options out there. Um, there yeah. are in the beauty segment per se, right? Um, so it's it's kind of stems from a like bringing together of values of people who believe in conscious consumerism. And um, in ASA, well, here we have a very, very key term called clean awakening. And that's crucial to our brand. And it's sort of uh, awakening a consumer to their conscious, to the conscious way of living, to a conscious way of life that they choose to go by. Um, and that is sort of like, and we're just sort of a catalyst to help us as a beauty brand is a catalyst to help people in their journey of conscious consumerism. It's not that we are the end destination per se, but we're just sort of a medium for people to feel like, Hey, I'm more in line with the way I want to live. And this brand is sort of Um, a stepping stone to getting me where I want to go and how I want to live my life wholly and fully. We'll come back to Asa uh, and we'll dial back a little bit on, you know, what you do and your background. So, so Sukriti, I was looking up on internet and my team was conducting some research. And so they shared that Sukriti was in Hong Kong, moved to New York and now in India. You know, uh, you've seen the world the East and the West. Um, And I know New York took to you to your studies. So how's that journey been, right? You've seen different, uh, I would say, cultures, different backgrounds, and I'm sure you've gained a lot of global knowledge. But why this journey from different areas? Yeah, so, you know, I'd say that I I feel very lucky that I got that experience. Um, I grew up in Hong Kong, so I was there for 18 years. And then for university, I went to New York. Um, And then, um, you know, back to Hong Kong. In the middle, I had a little bit of a Europe stint as well, where I studied abroad. And then finally coming back to India, it's allowed me to sort of approach um, whatever I do in life, specifically when it comes to business opportunities or even personal life from a very global perspective and lens. Um, and more than anything, like my interest has always lied in um, health and wellness, but it's never been a it's never been seriously been a path that I have um, aggressively followed in college per se. This sort of sprung up more so after I graduated. Um, and you know, growing up in Hong Kong, New York in the mix, India in the mix, you get exposed to all these different types of healing therapies. Like yep. of course, Ayurveda is massive but the way the west has used ayurveda ayurveda and created you know different types of luxury centers and resorts like you know or if we're looking at traditional chinese medicine or even acupressure for that matter yeah. how like seeing how all of these traditional therapies have now become you know have kind of all joined forces of sorts to create this general holistic in this space um ultimately leading to just someone's overall well-being. Um, And I feel that like when you are in different parts of the world and you get to see, um, you know, medicinal therapies of different cultures coming and and kind of sprouting up alive in these different environments, you feel that there is really something that pulls everything together. Um, and, And yeah, so I feel that that sort of has been a huge inspiration of sorts for me. That's been a um, it, it's been beautiful to see how people have 
like created things out of existing traditional therapies and created things that are their own just by mm-hmm. combining and tweaking and shifting and changing what already exists. You mentioned about the alternative uh, healing methods, uh, whether yeah. it is Ayurveda or the classic Chinese therapies. Uh, and I think, and I correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but you also ventured into that. Uh, post your graduation, you actually are yes. a certified nutritionist uh, from an alternative theory. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm a certified uh, health coach. Okay. So, uh, uh, you know, is the, that prompt you are Asa uh, or what, uh, what came first? Right. Okay. So, um, like I mentioned earlier, I was always very interested in the whole health and wellness um, space because I feel that the way your body feels directly mm-hmm. impacts the way you think. And overall, the way you think also impacts the way you choose to live your life and uh, to be the best sort of version of yourself of sorts, you need to, everything kind of needs to be in line. So um, that's where my interest sort of sprung up that like getting into the space of health and wellness and mental well-being of sorts. Um, And how did Asa come into the picture? Exactly, exactly that, that um, I wanted to be able to create a brand that, um, you know, is true to what they claim in terms of being Mm -hmm. actually good for you. Like the ingredients we use in our products are actually good for you. You know, we're using argan oil, we're using green tea extract, things like that, which are skin loving ingredients that when you apply the makeup, you don't feel it like forming a film or a layer on top of your face. You feel like, okay, um, you know, this is melted into my skin and it's giving me a nice glow and it all feels very natural. And I know I'm not harming myself in the long run. Um, So that being said, like, um, like I'd mentioned earlier, like the um, standards of beauty or skincare uh-huh. and products in India has not been that of, let's say, the EU, right? Where there are maybe 1,200 ingredients, over 1,200 ingredients that are banned from being used in these in, in these products to even be certified or allowed to be sold in the market. Wow. And it, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing like how they've created such stringent like measures out there. Um, in India, that's not so much the case. And, um, you know, and it, it would, um, you know, both my mom-in-law and I would think that like, why is it that we have to travel abroad to buy the products that we want? Why can't we find them in India? Yeah. And that sort of prompted this whole thinking that like, let's create something like let us create something that we would be happy to use and be proud of that like we're using this product and it has it's the same level of, of a product you might get in the EU and and feeling confident about that and and being able to create a made in India brand that you know people can happily use and consider it you know an, an, an easy local op, um, alternative than having to always get their products from abroad. Uh, if I have to put you in a time machine right now, uh, you know, and I see that you've gone ahead and built an entire concept around alternative medicine and uh, thoughts, but if I put you in a time machine and I take you back to your childhood, in, uh, how okay, was her thinking, Sukriti so like? What age? How young are we talking? Uh, probably at the age when you know we can still remember things, what we would do as children. So let's say at the age of 10, 12, 13, like, you know, when you remember things as grown-ups. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I remember as a kid, I used to, so we had this term in Hong Kong and it's for a lot of global kids. That's called third culture kid, Uh where, um, you know, you don't necessarily belong to the culture of the organization, um, sorry, Sorry, I'll just rephrase that. But it's um, so third culture kid is basically like a term where you don't necessarily fit into the culture of where you grew up. But, um, you know, and you and typically that's what that is the case with a lot of international students um, in our schools. And, in, in, in you know, and it so happened to be that so many of my friends were also in that space mm-hmm. um, where it's not like we were. Uh, part of like, let's say a a homogenous culture per se. And, um, you know, that always in the beginning used to unsettle me that like, where do I belong? Like I'm neither, you know, I'm I'm not neither, let's say Chinese and I'm neither Indian, but I'm neither like American or British. Like, where am I? You know, I'm in the middle of all of this. And, um, but you know, that actually propelled me to 
suddenly find a lot more confidence in being comfortable with how I am today mm -hmm. um, because I feel that it has um, pushed me to accept you know, unique verticals coming together and creating me for, for who I am. And I feel that, um, like you mentioned earlier, the, the exposure of the East and the West has um, allowed me to, you know, be comfortable living um, in the US per se and, and living that type of life or even moving to India and leaving the life over here. Um, so I find a lot of comfort in being able to adapt and move into, into situations. And as a kid, I would say that is, um, a core sort of value that sprung up this sense of adaptability and this sense of just like being able to speak to different people and actually loving learning about different cultures and situations. Um, that being said, like as a kid, I was always down for an adventure. I would always want to, you know, um, go, we would kayak to like abandoned islands on the outskirts of Hong Kong and just camp out there for a night. And nice. this is like you mentioned, 10, 10 or 11 years old. And, um, you know, those type of experiences also um, sort of force me now per se to take, take, take on challenges and to be okay being uncomfortable every now and then. Was becoming an entrepreneur and having a beauty brand as a child, you were thinking about it? So not at all, actually. Okay. I was, I mean, beauty was an absolute, like it wasn't, it always sort of was a part of my lifestyle in terms of I never use too much makeup. Um, I'm a, a minimalist when it comes to skincare and makeup, but whatever I use, I feel it has to be of high quality. Um, and it was always just a personal choice of mine in life. I never saw it turning into like a career path per se. Mm -hmm. um, and again, health and wellness has always just been like a passion of mine. It's the way I choose to live my life, but I never chose to study that per se. So and I guess being an entrepreneur as well, um, I never knew I'd have my own startup. Like I actually didn't know that that would actually, that would spring up in my life. And it, I feel like really, really um, happy that I was able to get into this space um, because I feel that there's a lot of innovation and creativity that springs up when you are, um, you know, working on something that's your own. Mm. And um, yeah, so how did I get into beauty? Well, like I mentioned earlier, like I am a bit of a minimalist, but I'm looking for high quality products. Yep. And, um, you know, so even with Asa, like we have multi-purpose products as well, which is um, a, a like our lip to cheek, for example, which is our cult favorite current. Mm -hmm. It can be used on the lips, on the cheeks, on your eyes. It can be used, however, on your face. And it's just this one product that you need to carry in your bag and travel, you know, and you're, you're sorted. Like you've got your flesh of color just by using this one product. Wow. Versus having maybe four or five products, like a separate lipstick, a separate lip balm, a separate blush, separate eyeshadow. So in a sense, it's just simplifying life and making it easy. But knowing what you're using is good for you. You use the word startup and Asa is a startup today. Uh, and there are some uniqueness in this company. So uh, let's talk about the first aspect. What have been your learnings or your share of uh, triumph moments, both uh, in those initial few years as you have begun on this journey? So um, tons, COVID to, you know, be given its due credit. I think uh, that was quite a, a fun experience to say the least. We were um, planning to launch maybe eight months before, okay. but because of COVID it got delayed. So there were delayed timelines and then we like as itself are super particular about the ingredients going in and making sure that our product is, you know, a good quality product. Mm -hmm. So there was so much back and forth in terms of shipping things back and forth, testing, trying, you know, trying to make things work. We were going to have like a, um, you know, a, a launch party of sorts and everything had to now be digital. Um, so like, because the world has now moved towards, towards the space of, um, you know, having a lot more of an online digital presence, um, our strategy also changed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and and in a sense, I I've never really been like a very digital first kind of person, but this is, this forced me in that direction. Okay. And I feel like the learnings, yeah, the, I mean, the learnings that came out of it, like performance marketing, what is that? You know, how can you be spending so much on just 
getting people to come to, you know, see your brand online. And, and now I'm able to understand the intricacies of it. Like I'm obviously far from being a technical expert of sorts, like far from it, but I can understand the concept a lot more. Um, you know, that being said, I live in Bangalore. Our team is mostly in Bombay and my, my uh, partner is also based in Bombay. So, you know, I, 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 and I guess like because of COVID, we weren't able to meet anyways. So this whole like Zoom culture also arose. And, um, you know, at times we found ourselves to be a lot more productive even yep. on Zoom than to meet in person. And, um, you know, those were some interesting learnings. So we're still trying to pursue a 50-50 model where 50% of the time we are together, like, touching, feeling, experiencing the product, and 50%, it's a work-from-home type of situation. Um, yeah, and I guess the other sort of big uh, question mark that has arisen is um, people have not me people for a period of time had stopped using makeup yep. because everything was work from home okay. and that was a big um i guess pain point for us that oh what's going to happen we're a new brand launching a new makeup brand launching in the middle of all of this yep. like what's going to come out of it and um you know and surely there was a a dip in um the the i guess like the makeup set the beauty segment not so much skincare but the beauty segment but now it's back on a rise and um, it's just that now maybe lipsticks that used to be like the first product someone would buy um, for a period of time, those had dipped and eye products had gone up, yeah. right? And you're talking about mascara, eyeshadow, things like that, because, you know, the mask covers the lower half of the face and it's just your eyes that are seen. So it's like kind of keeping abreast with what is happening in terms of consumer behavior and culture and making sure that we are able to give our consumers the experience that they are looking for um, at the end of the day. The second aspect of oh, Asa is you starting your business with your mother-in-law. Yeah. Also, how has that experience been? It's a different level of a partnership. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, it's, you know, so in the beginning, like, I, like everyone would ask me like, oh, like that's going to be quite an interesting space to get involved in. And, um, you know, and, and like it, it was a curious spot for a lot of people. But luckily, like my mom and mom in law and I, we both get along really well. Nice. Um, and nice. we both our strengths are very different. So um, it's nice because we kind of manage things in a way where we can discuss. Um, but at the end of the day, what we're managing is not conflicting per mm -hmm. se. And our whole outlook, like our vision for Asa is very much the same. And I think when your vision is aligned, then you can kind of always keep moving in that direction. And the type of experiences she brings from her life journey, um, you know, and the type of experiences I bring from mine, we can um, bring new learnings to each other. And I think that's what's been quite, um, quite like a lot of new insights have come to me because of that. And also, I've never really lived in India and mm -hmm. she has grown up here. So she really knows how to navigate the space, um, you know, and in a way that I found like a very strong backbone. Um, and without her, I don't think Asa would exist for sure. That's good to hear. Uh, in the short time of Asa, uh, are there any specific moments which you'd look back and keep pushing you? Because COVID has really impacted many of us and it can yeah. really deter us or you know, probably make us do things which we would never think of. But have there been any specifically from a business perspective, uh, yeah. things which make you proud, make you look back and say, no, this is why I'm doing this and keep pushing ahead? Yeah. So, um, you know, I think that one huge um, space that we, we really push for and believe in and a big pillar of ours is um, sustainability. And, you know, with the way the the world is moving right now, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I have a baby now and he's eight months old and thinking about his future and like the security of his future is really important to me and, and yep. the planet we're living in, you know, we have to be um, doing our bit to conserve what we can, 
here. So um, at ASA, we've come up with a refillable model where the cases are all like custom made and they're all sort of shapes designed and inspired by nature. Um, and essentially the inside of the product, once it's finished, you can pop it out and take, buy a refill and put the refill inside. So you're not necessarily rebuying the entire packaging. So our refill model is um, something that is obviously going to be a large uh, it's like a large, it's, a, it's sort of like a um, a space we're delving into, which has not been like, you know, explored before yeah. in India per se, um, where we're, con- change, we're trying to con- change consumer behavior to move towards a less waste, um, less packaging type of lifestyle and move towards a lifestyle where you're able to, um, you know, know that what you're, throwing out is not necessarily just landing up in the landfill, but it's something that can actually be recycled and reused. All our cases are in aluminium and, you know, so everything is in metal. So it's all reusable and and, and recyclable. So coming to your point, like whenever things get tough, whenever things get like, oh my God, like, you know, with with any startup, you're feeling like, am I, or will we be able to do this? You know, Um, then you're brought back to this thought that like, you're not just doing this for yourself. You know, you're doing this for the environment. You're doing this for the consumers out there that are looking to live a more conscious way of life. Our Mm -hmm. products are vegan also and cruelty free. So being able to provide that as an option for people as well. Um, And and just, just being able to be a brand out there to be like, hey, we're there with you. And, you know, we're there with you throughout your journey. And, you know, we'll be there throughout. So you just have to, you know, reach out. We're creating that community of conscious consumers and um, hope people can find a place over there as well. Uh, you know, I'm sure you've had your share of learning through COVID and through starting up a beauty brand, which is not easy. Uh, and navigating the ecosystem of approvals and claims and all of that. If you have to share your perspective or thought to somebody else listening to the show and saying, you know, even I had a beauty brand idea, which may be unique, uh, not conflicting to Asa or something else. Uh, what will your advice be to them? Um, so, you know, that's a really good question. I guess I'm trying to imagine myself way down the line when I just got into this space. I think um, if you are convinced um, about your vision and mm-hmm. your purpose and your place in the beauty segment, anything is possible. Like the space is very competitive, but if you're clear of where you want to take your brand forward and you're passionate about it more than anything, um, I think passion and grit, those two things combined are what will allow you to succeed um, in whatever space you get involved in. So, um, you know, sometimes we get scared and yep. we get overwhelmed yep. thinking that like, is there space for me here? There's so much happening and the people are doing so well. Like if I get involved, will I just get lost? And sure, that feeling had arisen in me too. But that being said, because I was passionate about the brand per se, and also because at this point I was determined just to make it happen, those two things combined help push us, um, you know, to actually launching us. And the other thing I would say from experience is that, so I'm a bit of a perfectionist and um, I always look to have things all in place before we go live or before we launch or before we kind of, you know, um, take things forward. Yeah. But when it comes to a startup, it's all trial and error and it's all about being present and handling things as they arise, as and when they arise. So, um, you know, if something were to not be 100% as per plan, that's okay. Like that's yeah. part and parcel of running a business. And it's okay to not have everything down like to the T before you launch. Um, you just have to get it started, get it moving, get it going. And the learnings and the, you know, the changes and the transition and the flow will all follow follow suit. Very, very, very interesting. Some great learnings. And I'm sure the listeners who are going to be uh, listening to the show, they will be saying, okay, and it motivates them to push ahead. Uh, you mentioned something, and I want to double click on that phase of your life. You mentioned about your baby, so congratulations on that. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much. And I'm sure with Asa being a baby and your your newborn baby boy, uh, 
how do you manage and how has family supported your venture and this entire ecosystem which you have built around yourself yeah that's you know um i feel like when you become a mom um and when, and that to a working mom mm-hmm. your respect for women just goes up 10 times more like i've always Definitely. been i mean and you're going through it on your own and both are sort of babies that are full time jobs per se you know yep. because it's not that it it is your own creation both of them so um i wouldn't say it's been the easiest thing and i think there're definitely moments where you feel like you're beating yourself down and you're very hard on yourself that like ah i can't even manage 100% the way i want because you're feeling kind of pulled in between but i feel like the balance does come around and you learn to um you know you learn to prioritize like i feel if anything um what the this combination has taught me to do is to number one be a lot more efficient with my time and my energy because now when i have let's say if shorya is sleeping now when i have 2 hours yeah. to work i am a lot more focused and a lot more efficient and i was i probably be able to um squeeze in what i would do in maybe 4 5 hours into those 2 hours um you know i feel a lot more confident in per se, in that space per se um and that being said when i'm with my baby like i i consciously make it a point that i'm present with him too mm-hmm. um and and if if work meetings have certain time frames that i've i've allocated and certain time frames are just for him so um making sure i'm not missing out on both has been a bit of a struggle but i think it's now reaching an equilibrium very interesting no it's uh, my respect for women i have surrounded by women at home and at work but i would say more at home uh, and my respect continues to grow every day whether it's my mother whether it's my wife whether it's my sister you know when i look at them and the kind of things they are trying to achieve and do at the same time manage the kids it's not that they only but you know managing the kids and uh, doing variety of activities the respect is pretty paramount for me at least uh, but building on further you know i'm sure as you've embarked on this journey uh, you would be consulting you would be looking up to somebody do you have like a a mentor or a person whom you look up to if you are thinking about okay what should be my next step be absolutely so um i think from a business perspective like i'd say i'm always a little bit more of like a creative mind but my husband um he is a very very business like oriented person and you know we would have these like 15 minutes a day check in where um i would bring up a certain issue um you know that from a business angle i don't know how to tackle per se um and he would always help bring perspective and structure and that in itself would make me feel like i've taken a step forward in my journey because i've i've learned something new about how nice. to run a business per se um i feel like that's been a really great support system to know that he's there at the end of the day to um help guide as and when needed and um also like in this journey of asa like i'd mentioned um i think my mom in law has been um pretty in- inspiring to see you know um see her lo- be able to launch a startup um and not feel frightened by this the term a startup and think it's too new age for her to get involved in you know and um you know she has is now completely full time focused on both her startups she's running um a nutraceutical brand and asa yeah. at the same time and um you know so it's it's quite inspiring to to see that and um to see that you know you can have so much excitement towards learning and creation and 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 building at whatever stage in life you're at um so that's something that i i do want to be able to imbibe when i'm you know older and um feel that like i'm perpetually in a space of creation and being able to contribute um and bring my vision and thoughts to life sure sure so could the uh, you know we've been talking about asa a lot throughout this conversation and uh, you know but a brand like yours which is a challenger brand i would use that uh, theme uh, you need to stand for something you need to stand for certain core values certain aspects which differentiate you when people as consumers look at your brand uh, or look at your products uh, they need to relate to it you did say that you use the word cult in your conversation uh, how 
uh, what are those values you are stood up for or your brand stands up for? Yeah. Um, um, so Asa as a brand um, is always looking to awaken the consumer to a more conscious way of life. And a couple of pillars that uh, fall in what we call our brand values is purposeful luxury, purposeful um, beauty, and purposeful living. Um, and essentially what we're doing here is we're looking at creating a product products that are over 92% natural, so they're not harming your body in any way. We're looking at creating products that are vegan and cruelty-free um, for ethical and sustainability reasons. We're looking at a full sustainable wing over here where products are refillable and mm -hmm. all made in aluminium. Um, so, you know, we're not looking at plastic packaging of sorts and even the way our products are shipped we're not using plastic wrap and things like that. Um, and of course, from a health and wellness point of view, ensuring that these products are not harming your body from within. And it's made in India and it's made for the global Indian women out there. Um, so the colors, the shades, the tones, everything that we are kind of coming up with has been tried and tested on Indian women to ensure that they are able to find um, the appropriate products that suit them. Um, so that's sort of a sign in a nutshell. Um, and why should someone have to compromise on their luxury experience? Um, and they, sh they should be able to get that along with all of these values. Um, and Asa sort of is at the crossroad of both of those coming together. So Kriti, this conversation has been very enriching and uh, hearing you out and, uh, the journey you are on, uh, I would just say best of luck on that because, uh, it's uh, definitely a long road ahead, but it's very promising on the the theme which you have latched onto and your company has latched onto, uh, which is definitely unique. Uh, I I can't I I may be making some presumptions, but I may not be the ideal buyer. But I'm sure uh, the people around me, whether it's my wife or my uh, other friends and uh, family, I will be definitely be promoting Asa in that lens. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's been a great pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, and thank you for taking time out. I know Shaurya may be waiting for you today, so I don't want to waste a lot of your time. But yeah. Not at all. No, I just want to thank you so much for, you know, um, choosing choosing me to be interviewed. It, um, it was really nice to hear all the other podcasts you've done. And you're doing such great work of bringing these things to life and people's journeys to life. Um you know, in respect to where they are currently. So amazing. I hope you keep it up and hope looking forward to your next few seasons. For sure. Thank you very much uh, for those kind Thanks. words. And I'm sure the listeners today will be inspired hearing your story. Thank you, Anise. Thank you so much and good luck. You too. Take care and be safe. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening in. And we close yet another episode of Masters Decoded. If you've enjoyed the episode, please, you can help us out by sharing it on social media. I would personally appreciate that. It's how we can reach more listeners, and the more listeners we have, the more awesome guests I can get in touch and convince to participate in these conversations that are a joy to have for me, and I hope they are a joy for you to listen as well. You can also help a lot leaving reviews on iTunes or your podcast service of choice. Reviews are surprisingly helpful in supporting the podcast to get to more listeners. If this episode has intrigued you, I would request you to subscribe to the podcast to stay up to date and get notified to the future episodes. With that, I bid you and see you in the next episode.